um, Lexington, Virginia, in the Valley of Virginia, way up in the, uh, the head of it. Uh, and that, in fact, is the setting for a good bit of what we'll be talking about this evening. Now, when I said we talk, I do intend this to be something of a conversation. In other words, I'd like to start out with, uh, oh, let's say 20, 25 minutes of uh, sort of explanation of, of the bones of this remarkable story. But then uh, what I found is that pieces of it intrigue audiences in different ways. And so we, uh, after consulting with Doug, I've built um, time in here this evening to respond to your questions about different parts of it as we go. Obviously, it's a, it's a book, and uh, this is one evening, and to, to narrate the whole thing would be um, impossible for me and tedious for you. So I, I don't want to impose in that way. But I do want to get you thinking a little bit about the nature of colonial Virginia. And in fact, let's start with the proposition that there were more than one colonial Virginias. So it's plural. It's plural. And I think that in a lot of ways, that's a very easy thing to imagine at a site like this, because obviously uh, right here at Mount Vernon, this remarkable site, we've got one colonial Virginia, which is uh, the, the colonial Virginia of the great planters. Now, Washington's a whole lot more things than a great planter, and so in a lot of ways, he's the perfect metaphor for what I'm talking about. He, he embodied a lot of different kinds of colonial American experiences. There's an urban um, colonial Virginia. That version today is maybe most easily uh, discerned uh, locally, uh, right in Alexandria, in the lot lines of the uh, of the city blocks, the, some of the same street names that we've seen in the um, uh, colonial period are right there in downtown. Uh, there's Christ Church, Alexandria. That points us towards another colonial Virginia, which is religious, mostly Anglican. Some of you, I'm sure, have visited some of the colonial era uh, churches that survive uh, today, Episcopal churches in, uh, here in Virginia. Uh, there are a smaller number of dissenter meeting houses as well that, that survive uh, Presbyterian uh, or Baptist, and a few of these still remain. And let's not forget the political and the economic versions of colonial Virginia. Um, the reconstructed governor's palace down in Williamsburg is a great example, or some of the surviving uh, colonial courthouses that dot the, the countryside, um, especially close by here down on the northern neck, um, th that enable us to, to remind ourselves of something of the political worlds of um, these colonial people. But uh, students of George Washington early acquire a more expansive view of that colonial Virginia. And um, it's a view that, hello. <laughs> well, it's a view we'll see in just a moment. But <laughs> I trust. Um, but it's a, a view with more, there we go. I never doubted it for a minute. I can do this with finger puppets. <laughs> really, <laughs> right? So I'm not worried about it. This is going to work. All right, good. Okay, so um, we have this 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 expansive notion of colonial Virginia that is very much part of Washington's world, and indeed he contributes to it largely, as as I'm sure this audience uh, understands very well. But um, the landmarks of that Washingtonian. Virginia, the continental Virginia, we'll call it, get uh, more complicated as we go to the west. And some of them are still architectural. Um, Washington's office in Winchester, for example, um, the streets and blocks, and I had a feeling that was going to be necessary. Good. The streets and the block lines of downtown Winchester uh, are a good example. His office in Winchester. Um, the, if you go up into Pennsylvania, um, and you have to want to get there, that modern um, version of this scruffy little fort necessity, right? Those are those are all those are all landmarks of uh, Western Virginia, a colonial 
but still colonial Virginia. And if you keep going past Fort Necessity, eventually you get out to 21st century Pittsburgh, this stunning view of the city looming over the concrete footprint of Fort Duquesne at the Forks of the Ohio. If you haven't seen that, you need to go. It's a remarkable uh, way to grasp it in one visual uh, moment, this understanding of what people like George Washington thought when they saw this Western country. In the West, however, most of the landmarks of, of Washington's Virginia are terrain features. They're not architectural like Fort Duquesne. And as Joshua Fry and, and Peter Jefferson drew it in 1751, Virginia's writ ran quite far, all the way out to Lake Erie uh, in the upper left-hand corner uh, of the map. In some ways, when we think about that colonial Virginia, we feel more closely connected to Washington's West by its natural grandeur. The towns of his day were diminutive. Winchester, and even smaller as Stanton. They sit in this broad valley, and they're surrounded, the valley is defined by these huge ridges, the Blue Ridge on one side and the North Mountain on the other. To the west of those towns is rough terrain, the Allegheny Plateau, and so many creeks, uncountable numbers, that on a day like today, just the simple act of crossing such a creek, it becomes a matter of survival, becomes dangerous. And intriguingly, as we start thinking about this colonial landscape that might still be visible in Western Virginia, we start to see other more complicated Virginias as well. And we get them in glimpses that Washington shared with ordinary people. Looking backward from a modern perspective then, uh, we sometimes are surprised by just how complicated this colonial Virginia or these colonial Virginia vistas could be. And notably, Washington's colonial Virginia was racially complex. Um, not all whites were free. Not all blacks were slaves. Two centuries after the fact, we have a little, little stick. There we go. Two centuries after the fact, for example, Douglas Southall Freeman's 1948 biography of George Washington mentioned an interracial marriage that in Freeman's Virginia, uh, as in Washington's, was illegal. And this quote is set, it concerns a couple living in modern day Rockbridge County in the upper valley of Virginia. Freeman was of course writing in the era of Jim Crow, the period during which racial segregation was legally enforced, that is enforceable by law. And implicitly at least, he seems to have been recognizing that Washington's Virginia was racially far more intricate uh, than his was, and his, of course, very much under debate in 1948. But of course, that's not how colonial Virginia was being presented in 1948. If you went to the sites that we normally associate with colonial Virginia in its eastern version. Indeed, that's true through much of the, uh, of the uh, second half of the 20th century. Many of you can remember a time when very few black faces appeared in any colonial Virginia, as presented in public history sites. In Monticello, for example, an anonymous servant uh, received a cameo appearance during the dining room portion of the tour. I remember this vividly from my bicentennial year tour there. That was it. And that's a far cry from today when the guides uh, 
discuss Sally Hemings in her master's bedchamber, as happened just a few weeks ago when I was there. Mount Vernon, too, has changed. Indeed, has become a leader in this, in this field. And your interpretation now includes not just the presence of slaves, but identities as well as lives and landmarks and narratives of enslaved peoples. This is important. But it's also important to recognize as we look at this emerging or re-emerging notion of colonial Virginia, it's important to imagine or recognize that for African Americans, the landmarks of colonial Virginia include more than landmarks of slavery. There also are landmarks of free blacks in colonial Virginia, like the road to Black Ned's Forge. Now today, we call that road by um, its 20th century name, which is Highway 11. Um, you may also have met it in the 19th century as the uh, Valley Pike, which is famous to his Civil War historians. And in the 18th century, you may know it as the Great Wagon Road uh, from Pennsylvania to the Carolinas, or as it's shown here in this inset from the Fry Jefferson map as the Indian Road. Uh, the Indian Road is shown at the bottom. Um, this is in the vicinity, this is a part of the road in the vicinity of Massanutten Mountain, uh, which is uh, on the border between the Fairfax Proprietary and uh, the rest of, of Colonial Virginia. Uh, so we're, that arrow would be uh, somewhat north of modern day Harrisonburg, Virginia. So Freeman's footnote about a, a Western free black man and his white wife gives us, um, offers at least a kind of tantalizing place to start exploring free black colonial Virginia. But what was his source? And you know, here we come back to that old thing that historians uh, we're all about sources. We, we want to know, we've got to document something. Uh, we want to know where he got it. And Freeman's footnote leads us back to an early 20th century translation from original German to English of a diary kept by a party of Moravian ministers that he mentioned very briefly in this one little footnote. But there's a lot of details, it turns out, in the source that aren't in Freeman's note. And let me fill that story in a bit. In that diary, the Moravians set out from uh, Pennsylvania on a mi migrating to, to the vicinity of what becomes Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And what they're doing is scouting a route. They're, they're engaged in this investigation of a good way to travel by land from Pennsylvania to North Carolina. And so in October of 1753, these ministers uh, journeyed along the wagon road, uh, along the Indian road, from, uh, to, to the vicinity of uh, modern day Lexington, Virginia. And there about five miles north of town, they met the uh, African-American blacksmith that Freeman described. And they asked him to shoe one of their horses, which he did. This man impressed the Moravians, who described him as a free man. And they wrote more about him than anybody else they encountered in their 500-mile journey. And remember that what they're doing is creating a kind of travelogue that's going to be used by other Moravian travelers as a guide to their route. So they're, they're really going to quite some effort. Well, why? Well, in part, they appreciated that the blacksmith was a man of faith. Uh, he and his wife told the ministers that they had heard Moravians preaching in Pennsylvania and that they loved people who spoke of the Savior. That last a quote. Now, that's interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, the Moravians in this era are not universally loved. Um, indeed, there are some pretty spectacular riots inside Pennsylvania churches 
by Lutherans who really don't want these Moravian interlopers coming in there uh, to the point of actually physically mugging the ministers. So that, you, know, you go to a Moravian service and it's kind of like you, maybe you're going to church and maybe you're going to a boxing match. You don't know. You know it's a very interesting uh, kind of social milieu that all of a sudden we get this little, little glimpse of. And, um, but the couple says, we've got a book of sermons. It's by this patron of the Moravian church. So they've, they've got this book. Now, the Moravians go on to say that the Smith, the free black man, understood German well. That's rare. The runaway slave ads for Pennsylvania slaves mention no fugitive slaves who spoke German before Black Ned ran away in the 1730s. It didn't happen. There were lots running away who spoke French or who spoke Spanish. They'd been brought up from the Caribbean to Pennsylvania. But to speak German, eh, that's a little iffy. They're unusual then for this skill. And as Freeman noted, of course, the husband is black, the wife white. The wife baked bread for them, and having done that, eaten the bread, ministers took their leave. You can imagine, by the way, what a great treat for these travelers. They're on the road for days and days and days. They're feeling really oppressed. They're scared of the Scotch-Irish Presbyterians. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but, but they are. Yeah. <laughs> they forded the Mari River later that morning and continued their way to Carolina. It's quite a record. But uh, you, can, you can almost understand why Freeman put this in there. Why? I mean, it's a biography of George Washington. Well, he's trying to talk about the complexity of Virginia. It's, it's, it's a weird place out here on the frontier, Washington's frontier. It's a place where, apparently, a black man and a white woman can be married and live you know, on one of the busiest roads in Virginia without any problem. This is interesting stuff. You know, the exasperating thing about this Moravian diary is they didn't name the blacksmith. <laughs> Come on, they named a bunch of other people who gave him a hard time. This guy helped them, and they didn't name him. This is so you can understand. Okay, this is an incident that colonial American historians know about. This is one of those kind of like baseball trading cards we play with each other. With you know, everybody who does, is in this line of work kind of picks this one up sooner or later. He goes, "Huh, what can we do with this?" Um, Somehow, somehow, before 1990, I made the connection that the anonymous Smith was the same person as the named Edward Tarr in these Western Virginia documents, who's the same as the enslaved Black Ned in Pennsylvania. The, there's, the, I, I only wish that I could say there was some great epiphany here. There was no music like we had right at the start of this presentation. There was no fanfare. There were no trumpets, no flash of light. It just sort of, oh, yeah, made a little note card on it and came back to it three years later. The, gradually, though, this intriguing man piqued my interest enough to begin collecting note cards about him and to follow him. And the trail led back to Pennsylvania where he can first be glimpsed in 1732 on the banks of the Schuylkill River at about the age of 21, enslaved. The slave Ned worked in the Pennsylvania um, ironworks. The, this, uh, this period in the 1720s and 1730s is really a time when speculators in Pennsylvania were working hard to um, build these, by our standards, very primitive ironworks that, that are um, comparable to some of the ones that, that were right in this vicinity, actually, uh, in, on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, these big, massive stone chimneys uh, that you feed from the top uh, with alternating layers of uh, iron ore, um, coal, or excuse me, charcoal, and limestone for flux. And you just keep cooking this chimney and dumping more stuff in the top for several months at a time. And periodically, you tap the bottom of the chimney, and liquid iron runs out and creates pig iron. 
that was Ned's industry. And Ned was a hammerman in a foundry uh, that took these pigs of iron, which could be, you know, say four feet long, uh, could weigh as much as 80, 90 pounds, uh, took two or three of these pigs at a time, and in conjunction with another hammerman, would melt them together in one molten iron mass, this red hot ball of maybe uh, weighing almost 200 pounds, and the two of them then with tongs would hold this thing underneath a water-powered trip hammer that would, um, using the, the power of water mills, would raise this massive uh, iron hammer over an iron anvil and smash into this mass. And the blow physically drove out the iron. The iron itself was solid, but the stuff that spattered was like liquid Coke bottles. Okay. So the, that's his job. A dangerous line of work, but it turns out a very interesting school. Because it's in that work that he was, um, he found, I think, um, one way to construct a different kind of race relationship. If the other hammer man is your master, and at one stage, Ned's master was the other hammer man, then you need, the two of you need, to have a much different relationship, right? I mean, you're, you're wrestling around this red-hot mass of iron. How many ways can that go wrong? And yet, and yet, he learned from this, despite the hazards of it, he learned these skills that start to point towards this remarkable ability to fit in to white society. Now, as they do this, um, in, in his final, um, in, in the end, towards the end of his period of enslavement, uh, Ned was purchased by uh, Thomas Shute, whose um, house is shown here just uh, to the north of Philadelphia. This is uh, up at the falls of the Schuylkill River, um, the road from Lancaster, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, you can see entering from the top left of this inset, um, actually crossed the Schuylkill at a ford right below the shoot house that's shown overlooking the, the Schuylkill River. Um, this is on, if you know Philadelphia, this is on the edge of Fairmont Park today. Um, so it's, uh, it's very much, today we would think of that as downtown Philadelphia. In these days, it's a much different kind of place. And what this, this um, picture helps us discern is that if, if you're going to try to learn more about a slave who became free, then you're just as, as the historian, just as bound to that slave's master as the slave himself, that we're all shackled in this together. And that turned out to be one of the tough challenges of, of writing this book. But again, once you recognize that, it becomes possible to look for information that bears on the slave in the history of the masters. And so this life in these fiery ironworks of southeastern Pennsylvania taught Ned lessons that apparently were rewarded uh, when Thomas Shute died in 1748 as quite an elderly man. Over the course of a lifetime, Shute had built a, a remarkable place here at this uh, Schuylkill River farm. Uh, partly it was a farm, partly it was a quarry, uh, partly it was a blacksmith shop, and it gave shoot um, uh, an entree into Pennsylvania and indeed um, uh, Atlantic trade uh, by means of uh, the Schuylkill and the Delaware rivers through Philadelphia. Now shoot had an unusual number of slaves for Pennsylvania. Uh, his will disposed of six, which uh, to people who work in colonial Virginia seems not, not large. Uh, but this is an unusual number, we're, we're told by uh, Gary Nash, uh, for, for Pennsylvania. And one of these was uh, a, a female, was assigned to an heir. Um, another one, uh, an elderly man, was to be cared for by another heir. A third was to be sold for, I'm quoting, the best price that can be got. 
So clearly we're not dealing with a master who's having a kind of uh, religious deathbed moment where he starts to think, well, I need to get out of the slavery business. This is immoral. But the other three, and this includes Ned, uh, were given an opportunity to buy their freedom on uh, a six-year installment plan. Ned made his payments in half that time. Uh, at the age of 37, he was free. Now, at first glance, Ned's next action seems really counterintuitive because he moved to Virginia. But remember that as late as the American Revolution, slavery existed in every colony, was endorsed by the laws of every colony. So it's important not to scrutinize Ned's decision through a 19th century lens that kind of divides uh, slave and non-slave states. And I argue in the book that Ned um, moved to Virginia for love. Remember that white wife the Moravians um, described. Um, interracial marriage was, it turns out, uh, just as illegal in Pennsylvania as it was in Virginia, colonial Virginia. And indeed, the penalty for it in the Quaker colony was more severe than in Virginia. But if Ned married across the color line in Pennsylvania and then immediately moved to Virginia, he could not be prosecuted for a crime in Virginia that he had committed in Pennsylvania. Pretty good, huh? How long would it taken, have taken us to figure that one out? Yeah. That's, I like this guy. The marriage made by a radical Presbyterian minister who moved from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, uh, to the Virginia frontier at the same time. Um, this, is a, uh, this may be one of those points I can come back to during the Q&A. This is a very uh, dangerous man himself. But in any case, Ned uh, joined, certainly joined, a neighborhood that had newly formed in today's Rockbridge County, a few miles north of Lexington. Um, and there, in 1753, he signed his name as Edward Tarr uh, on a pledge to pay a new Presbyterian minister at Timber Ridge Meeting House, uh, a meeting house that still stands, and the, the core of it may actually be, uh, may have been constructed during uh, Edward Tarr's period. Edward Tarr also signed the call that invited that minister to join the congregation. And Presbyterians uh, then, then and now are very uh, document driven. Um, it, it, I mean, it's, um, the, it's no easy thing to, uh, in the colonial period, to get a Presbyterian minister into your neighborhood. And it, there's a contractual aspect to it that Ned, as Edward Tarr, participated in and helped to call him and signed the legally binding contract to pay his salary as well. In the following year, in 1754, Edward Tarr purchased a 270-acre farm within sight of that meeting house on the wagon road. Wagon road shown here, entering the screen from the top where the top arrow is. And it's that uh, light, uh, that brown line uh, that kind of works its way in a southeasterly direction uh, down to the to the uh, arrow at the bottom. The orange arrow at the bottom it points to Lexington. This is an 1804 map uh, drawn as a recollection of original settlers and their properties. So uh, Lexington existed in 1804, but obviously not in the 1750s when uh, Tarr moved to Virginia. There, in this, on this land, Tarr's um, uh, shop, his smithy, his forge, became a prominent landmark for travelers and residents alike. The Moravians found it, and they weren't even from there, right? So he's on one of the busiest roads in Virginia with his white wife. He make it look so easy. Economic success, interracial marriage, full membership in a Presbyterian congregation, which may be the hardest one of any of those, and yet he's 
acceptance by his white neighbors. This is a really different colonial Virginia. We can start to understand why Freeman thought, I just got to play this note card. Right? Even in a footnote, I just got to get it worked in somehow. What a master of these relationships, these intricate relationships. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Another white woman. <laughs> Contemporaries describe the second woman I'm quoting as Ned Tarr's concubine. The term we need to take in its Old Testament sense of a junior wife or a subordinate wife, that is a woman in a house where there is a senior wife. Thanks. Around 1760, Tara and both women <laughs> moved to a new smithy in Stanton where we find them the following year. And the best way to describe what happened next is the even if I do say so myself, it's the first three paragraphs of The Road to Black Ned's Forge. In the autumn of 1761, a hamlet surrounding Augusta County's courthouse officially became Stanton, the westernmost town in colonial Virginia. By contemporary standards, it was a diminutive village in a vast frontier county. The residents faced a long road to any substantial town, 150 miles to Virginia's capital in Williamsburg, 300 miles to Philadelphia, the capital of Pennsylvania, over 400 miles to South Carolina's capital in Charleston. For Stanton resident Edward Tarr, however, Philadelphia and Charleston loomed claustrophobically close that fall. On 6 October, Edward Tarr and a North Carolina white man named Hugh Montgomery stood before two justices of the peace in Stanton. Montgomery complained that he had, I'm quoting, purchased a Negro man named Edward Tarr from one Joseph Shute of Charleston, son of the late Thomas Shute, again quoting, to whom the, Edward, the said Edward belonged to in the province of Pennsylvania. Tarr denied Montgomery's ownership claim, asserting instead that he had bought himself from Thomas Schutz's executor and grandson, William Davis of Philadelphia. As the magistrates weighed Montgomery's complaint, they reviewed more than a set of documents. They also explicitly considered the firsthand, their firsthand knowledge of Tarr's larger story. Tarr, they noted, again quoting, has resided in this county for 10 years last past and is a freeholder. The magistrates hesitated to enslave someone they had known for a decade as a free and economically independent man. The rest of Edward Tarr's story is in his book. Um, I'd like to uh, hear some questions now and, and work on the dialogue part of this for the evening. Doug? Let's, let's give a quick round of applause. Oh. Beginning. Thank you. Come back, come Thank back you. in to the scene. <laughs> Wander off. Okay. Uh, it's a rich book, uh, as, I, as we've talked about a little bit. Uh, it, it's an extraordinary work of social history, reconstructing the lives of ordinary people in the, 17th, in the 18th century is you know, a masterful challenge. All these uh, little fragments of stories and lives that are scattered around. There's a lot of genealogists here in the room too. I mean, they know and understand. It's, it's really remarkable. One aspect of the book, before we open it up for questions, I want you to talk briefly about is uh, mobility. It's one of the important themes throughout the book. It's an important theme today. We all see people scattered to the winds, our own families are all over the country, all over the world. Uh, and it was no different in colonial Virginia. And I think there, there sometimes is that sense of the colonial world as a, as a simplistic, you know, pretty clear cut 
Uh, and what you see in, in this rich uh, story that Turk lays out is this dramatic movements of people across vast distances, for given the transportation methods. Uh, and so tell, us, tell me a little bit about how you kind of reconstructed the flow of people in the face of the dearth of all this uh, information. put numbers Augusta County up to Philadelphia just because I think that maybe uh, maybe I might get a better price for them up there and we'll be back in a couple of months to the loop you know yeah. so so there's a the, and, and this is something ordinary people are doing now now notice we've seen that for the guys like Washington because George Washington we know there I mean there's a guy where we really can see how she's moving this vast landscape Is uh, really is dying. It's dying. It's even better. It doesn't sound good. Yeah, well, I mean that—that's one of the the great things that you're able to capture here. It's a story that's it's known. It's very hard to do. It, it, it's really uh, fantastic. Now, before we open it up to the audience, I do want one other nugget. You got to give another nugget. From this book, because uh, there's there's Thomas Shute, uh, the yeoman, who establishes his wonderful little farm and the quarry and all the other things he's involved in, uh, and and then his his brood of uh, ne'er do well children. I mean, you uh, gotta you gotta give him something about the, you know, the these uh, these characters who appear. Well, who who doesn't know a family with problems, right? <laughs> but the Shutes um, seem to be pretty remarkable in that regard. Thomas Shute, the patriarch, um, was, a, was a yeoman, which is actually kind of a term that, that colonial historians use a lot, but, but when pushed, we have to flounder a little to, to say what it is. I mean, basically, we understand, okay, a yeoman is somebody who's not a gentleman. Okay, that, that helps a little. Um, he's, he owns land, great. Um, he may work the land with his own hands. Okay, I'm getting a picture. Um, but they also are entrepreneurs and get engaged in all sorts of business. Uh, it, Thomas Shute uh, at different times uh, was a, a miller, uh, a miner, uh, involved in the iron business, involved in copper mines, uh, quarrying good, good stone, marble, and having it finished and exporting furniture to Barbados. And I mean, you know, just, just really one guy? And part of the way he did it, though, is through his children. He had a large family. I should say his two wives did the heavy lifting on this part. But they, they had, the three of them, had a large family. And the, they created what today we might consider to be a diversified uh, enterprise, where the different sons are put to work in different parts of the business. Um, so one's a cooper. Uh, one is uh, a yeoman farmer. One's a miller. Um, the one, Joseph, the one we met briefly right at the end, went to Charleston as a, as a commodities merchant and became 
uh, a merchant of uh, elaborate goods, the, the kinds of consumer goods that were in demand in the, among the Charleston elite. So these children, all in their different ways, are contributing to Thomas Schutt's economic success, but what nasty people. Oh, I mean, one of them, let's see, one of them ended up having a jailhouse epiphany where he, he sincerely repented of uh, being a drunkard uh, but, and signed a statement to that effect while in jail. Um, another one um, was so financially irresponsible that his father repeatedly had to bail him out. He's constantly being sued and maybe teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, this, was, this one was a smith. Um, and Joseph Shute went bankrupt twice, once in Charleston and then came back to Philadelphia and did it again in, in Philadelphia. Uh, Joseph was by far the worst actor, certainly. Um, he uh, left his second wife in Charleston, living in a shack on the back of the Quaker uh, lot down in Charleston, and went to Philadelphia and got a little too comfortable uh, with an um, indentured servant girl, uh, and by which uh, he fathered a child. Uh, so, you know, it's just on and on and on. They're nasty people, and it, it, by, their, by their take. Your you know. kind of people, Turk. All right, so op <laughs> let's open it up for some questions here from our kind of people, good people. Um, the, the question was, in the course of researching all of this, did I ever come upon people who had great connections to this land? And um, I, I should say, and I, this part I left out of the book, these are my people too. I mean, I, I got drawn to this area initially by the fact that I'm descended from people who lived at Timber Ridge. Um, but that, that seemed to, to, as I was working on the book, it really seemed to sort of detract from the story. Um, in modern times, what I've done is talk to a lot of people around there. I have, I've not met um, any um, people who could be sure they were descendants of 18th century slaves. But there is, uh, in Lexington, uh, a fellow who is um, uh, the descendant of some of the slaves at um, Buffalo Forge at, at um, uh, which uh, Charles Dew described in this 19th century book about a 19th century ironworks in Rockbridge County that used enslaved labor. So there is, there is some of that remaining. But um, to a remarkable degree, this, the, the, in general, the colonial past is not well remembered uh, anywhere. Uh, it's, just, it's just, you know, human memory erodes. And um, I had I gave a lot of talks at, at an early stage up and down the valley, hoping that somebody would say, oh, I got a bunch of old papers in the attic. Um, <laughs> you ought to take a look. And it, that never happened. Um, it happened to another guy who found a piece of the Edward Tarr story uh, up outside of Winchester. One of my colleagues, Warren Hofstra, uh, found in, you know, literally just, you know, almost picked it up, uh, one of the sources that's in, now in the book, but I didn't, I wasn't that lucky. Lucky my friends, but not, not in the find. Who's next? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. You found Edward Tarr's name and connection. Uh, I was wondering if there's any information on the name of his wife or any connection to her family since that's such a, such a unique situation at that time. Right. Um, I looked for that woman everywhere. <laughs> I mean everywhere. The, the concubine... You don't, you don't have a name at all. You don't no, have... for her there's not. Yeah. She's never named. Yeah. No. Scotch woman. Yeah, this, that's the, the, the Moravians described her as a Scotch woman, and that's it. But the second one, uh, his name was Ann Moore, and... Um, her her story is uh, is as I spin out in a little more detail in the book um, is that she was a widow um, and becomes part of the family during this period of crisis. Uh, the the Seven Years' War 
fell very hard on Augusta County. And uh, many people fled as refugees. And Edward Tarr was one of them, along with his wife, and they seemed to have picked up this second woman in the course of that. And so her name was Ann Moore. Um, that turns out to be maddeningly common in uh, Pennsylvania and Virginia. Um, so I, I could never get anything that would hold up. Um, and never, you know, you, you, one of the things that is hard in this business is that sometimes you look and you go, okay, I've got these pieces of the puzzle. Maybe they work and maybe they don't. If I were writing a novel, it'd be easy. But, you know, connecting the pieces is very, uh, under, under scrutiny of guys like Doug, you know, they understand. <laughs> I mean, besides this day job here, he's, he is, you know, a very demanding editor. And so you, you, need, you need to be able to show that the pieces really, really fit together. So. You know, you mentioned that the, the memory of that, the communities are obviously long stretched away from the colonial experience. One of the great things in the book that he brings to life is the, the trauma memories of that valley mm -hmm. in the Seven Years' War and how it would shape the way people interacted, you know, in that time. The yeah. memories of what people did during the war, of the, of the, uh, of the, of the violence. Yeah. Something obviously connected closely to Washington's early life in the in from, from here that we're always trying to understand is that uh, that that violent uh, story of the of the first uh, great conflict in that, yeah. that area. And and in fact, if you if you think about Washington's career, uh, making that that loop through the back country at one stage during the Seven Years' War, he's trying to hold people together and you know, encourage them. You got to stay. You know, you can't just keep running. Um, and the, the, the thing that Doug's referring to is that, that people who stayed after the war then uh, had a more, uh, I, I think, a, a, a more harsh uh, attitude towards their, um, their neighbors who fled to safety and then came back. And so there's a lot of, there, there appears to be a lot of conflict that comes out of that. Uh, and the, the, this uh, problem that Rattar has being challenged with the, you know, the 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 uh, uh, second wife, that that seems to come out of a, some other neighborhood friction that that I would um, I think associates with the uh, with the refugees. Yeah. I, I saw you first, sir, and then we'll go over there. Go ahead. Were there other Edward Tars? Were there other Ed Edward Tars? that you came across in your research. And ultimately, as we look as you, as you consider yourself a social historian, did it really have any impact as we progressed into the late 18th century um, in terms of slavery? That, that's, a, that's a great historian's question. It, were there other free blacks? And the answer is yes. One of the things that, um, I mean, there's, there, this is, this is not unique to my work. There's a kind of, um, a kind of a wave of new understanding about colonial era free blacks. Um, there's, a, there's a group that's, that's meeting at Monticello that, that deals with Central Virginia's uh, history that, that is tracing both the enslaved and the free histories of the 18th and 19th century. And they're, they're working on uh, prosopography, basically, big, big collective biography. Um, there, are, there are a number of free blacks in Augusta County beyond Edward Tarr. Uh, I, I uh, arm wrestled with the UVA press guys and got into the book an appendix that includes every one of them um, and all of the original slaves in, that could be identified by name in Augusta County. So there are more, and I should say, it's not a frontier phenomena. If anything, there's much better established free black communities in um, the oldest counties. If you go down to York County, uh, one, one of my colleagues, Julie Richter, um, in, uh, has done a lot of research down there about these free black families that, that are landowners, um, and the more um, that you investigate these cases, the more you find that they're, they're doing what Edward Tarr did. Tarr went to court. He sued a white guy and won um, a judgment. He defended himself against a number of suits for debt, 
So there, these free blacks appear in court, but they appear with regular names. So there's no racial identifier in the, in the record. So unless you know exactly who they are, you can't tell any kind of racial identity for them. And so in the past, people have assumed, well, they're not, they can't possibly sue because they're black. No, 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 that's not how the law worked. I mean, the, the, the law protected free blacks in some very interesting ways. In, in 1765, um, the free blacks of Virginia petitioned the Virginia Assembly for um, relief for two things. One was that their, um, their children were being bound uh, up to the uh, age of 31 uh, if they were if they were um, uh, born to a free parent but illegitimate, and they got that cut back to what it was for white children, which was age 18 for girls, and age 21 for boys, um, and they they made a revolutionary argument to do it. Um, in 1768, they do it again, and they come back, and this time they're they're saying we should our wives should not be taxed, which under colonial Virginia, free black women were taxed, but free white women were not. And so they come back, they petition the General Assembly, they say this is, this is a violation of our rights as free people, and the General Assembly, and Richard Henry Lee's the sponsor on the bill, the General Assembly goes, that's right. And they change the law. There's this moment leading up to the revolution where you look around and go, they're these free black residents of Virginia. They're claiming political rights. They're pulling together. And as they pull together, they're successfully invoking the very rhetoric of revolution that these, other, these guys like George Washington are, are, are using. What screws that up? The American Revolution. It is. It's the revolution. The revolution is very bad news for free blacks. <gasps> wow. But when you start to look at it, in every state after the revolution, where slavery still has a grip, they start thinking about new changes to the law. Now, some of these drag on. You know, they're, they're still voting in North Carolina in the what, in the 1820s or 30s? 1840s. 40s? Okay. Yeah, but Chuck, you neglected to mention that the, the problem was because of it's the Scots-Irish who ruin everything. So we all know that. Uh, well, yes, we, issue, we have a way to doing that. They're voting now, and that's the problem, <laughs> right? Uh, so uh, anyway, yeah, so great. I mean, a absolutely fantastic question. Uh, did we get all, did we get all the question? There was, you were talking about, but you were talking about, yeah, impact, what didn't matter, right? And he got to that. Good. Yes, ma'am. So you. That's okay. I have a few quick questions. Um, when I was reading the description um, regarding tonight's lecture, um, he mentioned that he got in trouble for having a second uh, common wife. So how did he get in trouble? Was he chased out of town? Did he have any children? How many children did he have? And uh, lastly, um, were you able to talk to any of his descendants? I can't find them. <laughs> the, question, the question was, have I talked? The, the, there's several, actually. What happened to them after the, after the confrontation? And then were there children? And then was I able to find them? If there were children, I couldn't find them. There's no documentary suggestion that there were children. No, they, they, I mean, now, now part of that is a loss of records. Um, the, the Presbyterian baptism records, Presbyterians did infant baptism. Um, and so the baptism records for that period that, that's, most, that's his period, um, unfortunately burned in a house fire. Um, so we don't have those. There's no other evidence. I mean, one of the things that, that I keep hoping is, well, somebody will read this book and go, that's my great-grandfather. You know, and in which case, then all of a sudden, a whole new line of a uh, <laughs> second book opens up. But, the, but they're just, there's no evidence of them out there. Now, as to what happened to them, um, it's clearly okay with some people that 
Tar has this unusual relationship, including it's okay with his wife. The prosecution could have prosecuted him for adultery. But no adultery. It's adultery. <laughs> In Virginia law at that time. They could have done it, but you need the wife's testimony. If they're, live, if they're all living under the same roof, nobody else can get inside the house. If the wife won't testify, you don't have a case. So they didn't prosecute him, they only prosecuted her. This is very interesting. And in the end, um, she didn't show up for a court date. So there was judgment by default. They um, levied a fine, they gave, they, they gave in all of these cases, um, they gave a choice for, for common women of a fine or uh, lashes. Uh, there's, there's very good records of all the public whippings and, and no record of her. So it would appear that, you know, they paid the fine and that was, that was the end of it. Um, she didn't move away. You know, so, so she's still around and invisible in the records as well. So they, basically the charge is over. Uh, and they continued to live uh, at, on, um, uh, at his uh, forge on the edge of, of Stanton uh, until uh, at least the, se well, 1770s for sure. Right here, yeah. Is there any way that you can then subsequently trace through the land holdings or the economic uh, holdings that would then be passed on to see who, 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 who benefited from his estate, let's say? Um, the question concerned is, are the documentation for any estate of TARS. Um, and there's no, I mean, many of you, I think, have worked with these kinds of records, probate records of different sorts, inventories, wills, um, and, and uh, state accounts. Um, there, uh, I'd love to find something like that for his estate. But if he died in Augusta County, there's no record. Now, let me jump right in and say, there were other free black records that are from state accounts from this period. So, so it's not like there's any, there, they would just say, no, we're not gonna, we're just not gonna pro, you know, deal with probate for those estates. These are very legalistic people. And um, if you think about it, they have to be. The, the slavery depends on the law. If you, don't, if you don't enforce the law systematically, you undermine uh, respect for the law. And so it's more important to let maybe one really smart guy step out of the system than it is to try to hold him in the system at the expense of the legal regime that sustains the system. So. Yes, ma'am. Um, if, if black women were taxed wouldn't the wife of Edward have been taxed? She's, she's white. So even if she is the quote unquote property of a black man, she would be considered white? Well, she, she was a white woman. Um, and so while, she, while her legal rights were, were um, certainly subsumed under his, she was not his property. Um, but she wouldn't have had rights to own property, for example. Uh, she would have had the same rights as uh, other white women did, which did exist. I mean, it, there's, um, th that's a, this is a very intricate subject, but there's an essay in the William Mary Quarterly by uh, Holly Brewer that, that um, lays out kind of the, the law of property uh, in a way that's pretty accessible. Um, to about uh, about inheritance and so on and so uh, no I it's not it's probably not accurate to say that she had no rights the, the, her she had rights that were inferior to her husband's rights but that's not the same thing as no rights I'm not an, I'm not apologizing for this I'm just describing it right it, yeah in, in law they're one body yeah. with him as the head of household right flesh right but in that case yeah he's he covers her rights, but she has other, other property rights that could be designated to her by him or by her father, other people, I mean, so. Yeah, and that's especially true for real estate. Yeah. 
Okay. But the, and the thing about the way that uh, black women are taxed as opposed to white women, that goes back to the 17th century, and it goes back to a notion that what you're taxing is you're taxing the ability to produce income. You're taxing labor. And the assumption in the law is that white women who are in married situations are not working in the fields. They're not creating tobacco, the main cash crop, that is, is the measure of how much tax you can pay. But if you have a black woman in your household, she's most likely working to create more money, and so therefore we're going to tax that householder on the basis of how many black women are in that household, et cetera. So, uh, it, you know, that, that's where that cra you know that, that's where that's coming from. Obviously, it's it, it's racist, it's fundamental to the system of slavery, but it's about taxing the householder's ability to produce income. Right, um, which and it really affects free blacks in this way because you know you're essentially you you are you are taxing you know uh, the householder for having a wife essentially yeah for doing exactly yeah, what we, you want them to do yeah right. it, it, I I once did an article on this this really didn't change much until the 20th century mm -hmm. um, uh, when a woman in in Minnesota where I was writing at the time inherited a farm when her husband died she was required to pay taxes on the full amount as if she had not contributed to the creation of the farm right. yeah. through her labor. But it, at any rate, that, that's a side point. But I'm, I'm just curious, uh, with respect to, to Edward, what motivated his owner in Pennsylvania to have sold him? We just visited to the Magnolia Plantation down in South Carolina where it was said that the um, the Smith was the most valuable slave on the plantation and created the most revenue for the plantation um, and so for him to purchase his own freedom as the most valuable you know person would have been a huge monetary achievement what monetary metric were were they using well, uh, uh, let me let me take the question as being about the the decision by Thomas Shute to to uh, allow these three men to earn their freedom. Um, the the prices that sh that um, that Shute acquired. You're right. These are these are skilled artisans. Um, but there's also in, in all of these colonial estates, there's an issue of access to cash. Um, you have, on the one hand, you have an estate which may be quite valuable but illiquid. Um, no, no ready cash to hand, but lots and lots of property. And um, so, in some ways, it kind of makes sense to pick some assets and say, these, these need to produce cash. Um, and it may be, in part, it may just be a judgment by Thomas Shute that says, uh, I know these guys are going to want out of slavery. I know they're going to work hard, and at least one other one successfully got out. Um, and so um, that's a way to generate the cash that the estate needed for the debts it owed. So that's one possibility. Um, a second possibility is that by this time, uh, Tar's in his 30s. And uh, you know that that may look uh, younger to me than it did when I started working on this book, but but it you know it's still it, uh, for the day it's a little past it's a it's a little past his prime, um, and so there may be a, a different kind of calculation, again economic, that says let's let's let this go. A third possibility, completely unknowable, is that um, because of the force of his personality that Ned and these other slaves persuaded him, yeah, yeah, you gotta really let us go. You know, we've worked so hard for you. I mean, you can, you can kind of imagine it. You can't, you can't prove it, but you can imagine um, a non-economic uh, answer as well. It's all speculation. What I try to do in the book is, is lay out the, uh, the possibilities and, you know, good luck, you, you get to pick, so. Yeah, I mean, these are human relationships. That's right. I think you're particularly talking about the close work together, uh, you know, in the way you describe it. You know, that's certainly plausible, and we do see that, you know, so in cases that are documentable. So it's, uh, yeah. you know, and it's a different, the colonial world is, it's not late, or it's not right before the Civil War, 19th century Deep South. It is a different world. Uh, and it's important, I think, it, in your book, and many others have done this, it's going to show the complexity of, of how different levels of freedom 
you know, existed and were negotiated in different ways. Right. Uh, and right. and kind of opens up possibilities. Yes, ma'am. Last question, I think, right? Yes. Uh, who, who helped um, Edward Tarr on his property? Who helped Edward on his property? Um, there's no record of him uh, having any kind of worker assigned to him or bound to him. If anything, there's one instance where there's a, there's a white boy who's there. Um, it's not clear at all where he comes from. His surname just doesn't fit. He's not from here. But um, the, the, the magistrates say, oh, we got to get that kid and, and you know, bind him to a guardian. So they actually take him away. But there's no record of any kind of labor other than the women uh, on his on his site. Um, so so there there are instances, as as you I think are aware, that there are these instances of of uh, free blacks owning enslaved people. But there's no such thing. There, there's no example of that in Augusta County, this whole big frontier district in the colonial period. Did no, look at it. Did, did George Washington know Edward Tarr? Nobody knew Hugh Montgomery. Yeah. Well, small world out there. And really, uh, uh, thank you very much. Let's give him a big round of applause. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> they might call for an encore. That's fantastic. Uh, right, first off, um, before some administrative, well, let me do some administrative things. Uh, so as you all know, th th we have the books for sale back there. Uh, Turk is going to come sit right over here and he's going to sign them. We're not going to let him leave until everybody gets them signed for themselves and their, uh, their friends. Um, they're back at the, the table. There is one thing I'd like you to uh, take a glance at back at the table. There's a new garden book that has just been uh, produced by Mount Vernon. It's really the first publication out of the library. It's called The General in the Garden. It's a new look at George Washington's garden and landscape. It's got three great essays in it by Mount Vernon experts. Dean Norton, of course, many of you know, in charge of uh, uh, gardens for a long time in horticulture. It's got uh, Adam Irby, one of the curators, and Esther White, the archaeologist, looking at the reconstruction and understanding the garden and the people who labored in it. Uh, it's got the list of plants in the back. It's a fantastic, beautiful coffee table style book. There's only one copy right now in existence, and it's back of that table, so you can't have that one. But the others are literally on a slow boat from China, and they will be here sometime, sometime, I understand, in early February a book that's also distributed nationally by the University of Virginia Press. Uh, and so um, with that, I, I also just want to say uh, thank you all for coming out tonight, uh, of all nights, to say, eh, you know, I don't really want to trudge up that hill. It's freezing cold out there. So I really appreciate it. I know that Turk appreciates it. It's really important for authors of books like this that aren't the ones that uh, are make, trying to make the splashy popular argument that's easy to make, that doesn't take till 1990 to find out where the hell all this is. Uh, and so it's people who write these books are so fundamental for other historians to be able to tell uh, the stories that sell much more. So we really appreciate it, Turk, and I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. All right, so uh, I'll see you next time. Michael, thank you.